All right, we started the recording. All right, so by my clock, it's uh, 1300 hours coordinated universal time, time for the meeting to start. Welcome everyone. Uh, for me, it's uh, eight in the morning. I know for a number of people on it's uh, Central European summer time. See that you're in the middle afternoon and I'm sure we have some people on in the evening. Uh, welcome to the to joint uh, measurement and analysis for protocols research group and measurement analysis tools working group uh, meeting. Uh, I'm Dave Planka. I chair uh, with Miria Kulwin, the MapRG group in the IRTF. And our uh, co-chair for this meeting is Nina Bergeson. Uh, and uh, she can introduce herself in a minute when we switch to her portion of the content. But um, she's uh, she co-chairs with uh, our colleague Brian Trammell, the uh, measurement analysis tools working group for the RIPE uh, Regional Internet Registry. We have a two and a half hour session scheduled today. I think we have a little less content than that, so we should be pretty comfortable in terms of timings. Uh, this is our recording notice. The meeting is being recorded now, and all the presentations will be. They'll be. It'll be available on the IETF YouTube channel, and as usual for MapRG after the meeting, I'll post individual links to each of the talks on the MapRG wiki, which is available through the MapRG page linked here. Uh, someone has their audio on. Uh, if you could please mute it, that would be helpful. Uh, in many trivia for today, uh, the charters for these respective groups are at these URLs. Uh, this is the first time we've tried this experiment of uh, a combined MapRG meeting with uh, with Ripe uh, Matt WG, and the idea was that if we did it outside the IETF meeting schedule, then Maybe more people could join between the two when both of our groups have been having a bit of uh, trouble scheduling uh, in the pandemic era. Uh, both the groups have mailing lists uh, that are mentioned there that you can subscribe to, uh, where, for instance, you would have heard about this meeting being scheduled. Today's slides can be found at that URL there. And of course, all you've already know, but the WebEx link uh, is available in the agenda and in these slides at that URL. So, um, Nina, why don't I pass it to you and you can introduce yourself and tell the folks about the first part of the agenda. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so I am I'm Nina Barbison. I co-chair the uh, right in, uh, the right working group on uh, measurement analysis and tools, along with Brian Tremel, who's also on the call today. Um, Hello. Hey. Um, and um, today we're going to talk about. So basically, the 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 wedding group mostly focuses on on, on measurements and on tooling, and uh, a lot of the time we also focus on at, right atlas system. Um, and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the mechanisms and performance evaluations of the right PMAP to geolocations. But Massimo is going to talk. And then we will have some measurements about what happened under the, uh, the pandemic that we are still running through. Uh, but so far, and we have Vesna and Lai is going to give us um, their observations on that. We also thought that we would have an, uh, a tools update from the RIB NCC. People, please be mindful of muting their microphones. Thank you. Um, uh, but unfortunately, we, we have to cancel the tools update and we will just have to show up at the next right meeting to get the latest news on the Atlas and other tools from the right NCC. Uh, but happy to be here and I'm really excited about this uh, joint meeting is this is my first ITF uh, related meeting. Ooh. All right, well, okay. welcome Nina and thank you for um, that overview. Um, so following the portion that Nina will be running with the uh, the, the items that she just enumerated that were um, that, that were organized by Matt, 
we'll switch to the MapRG meeting proper. And MapR MapRG is in the IRTF, and so we have an intellectual property rights statement that uh, binds uh, you to, as a presenter, if you have intellectual property regarding it, you should disclose that, um, just the CAN portion. So this will be an official MapRG meeting as well. And this applies only to the MapRG portion of the meeting. So the second part of the agenda that Miria um, was wonderfully helpful in uh, in putting together here are the following. We'll, we'll have a, a presentation about measuring and analyzing the RFCs themselves, the security sections, the sort of a meta analysis uh, by Mark McFadden. Then we'll switch to uh, Jay Holland talking about latency and AQM observations on the internet. Uh, then Philip Brune on packet latencies in mobile networks. Mike Kosek is with us to talk about uh, their paper and uh, from an academic conference, must should don't care TCP conformance in the wild. And then we'll uh, switch it to, uh, it's the last session and portion of the session to Stephen Stroh's talking about deboganizing this uh, slash 12 prefix uh, that the RIPE NCC is now using. Um, to, before we switch to some advertisements for various projects, um, I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to run the meeting. For you to the presenters, I'll switch you to the best of my ability to you being the host in the meeting, which will allow you to, to show your slides. Um, if you have any trouble with that, no problem, let me know and I'll, I'll show them like I'm going to do for Mark's presentation. For those participants that have questions, um, please use the chat icon, which usually shows as a round circle on your WebEx window and you can chat to everyone. Just type plus Q and that will create a queue of people that we will uh, invite you to ask a question by unmuting yourself and doing so. If you'd rather the chairs ask it or someone else ask it on your behalf, just type the question in that chat box to everyone so that we can see it. And uh, we'll have some time between each of the presentations to visit those uh, questions there. Uh, MapRG invites projects that are not presenting at the meeting to also give us advertising slides for their projects. And for this meeting, Miri and I created a couple that, because we have not met so far this year uh, because of the, uh, the pandemic and scheduling issues between IETF 107 and 108. This is our first meeting of the year. So let's bring you up to date on some of the content that we would usually have hosted in MapRG. Um, IMC, uh, one of the preeminent uh, measurement conferences took place last year in October and PAM uh, 2020 in March of this year. Uh, when, uh, and that's on either side of the beginning of the pandemic and lockdowns for most of us. So um, what we wanna do is remind you here of a couple of papers, for instance, Giovanni offered these as potential papers to present here, but we decided not to because they'd been presented at um, MAP meetings prior but uh, the IMC content is up with the links to the papers and to videos. And I can, uh, I'm happy to say that also Pam did a nice job of recording the videos and also making, uh, I think, registration free for that event when it happened. So you can check either of those URLs to see these papers and the others from those two conferences. Uh, another uh, one of the permanent measurement conferences was TMA that was held in June of this year. Similarly, um, TMA has had recordings or videos of the um, of the papers, and th those papers are up at that URL. And uh, Gareth, one of the chairs, has created a YouTube playlist at that URL for the subset of papers where the presenters gave permission to share the video. So check those out. Uh, lastly, uh, Anna Brumstrom has offered to us uh, uh, this this advertisement for a project with uh, she and her co-authors, where they studied uh, narrowband uh, IoT uh, it, uh, Internet of Things devices in two major metropolitan areas, uh, and their my understanding is their their interactions, for instance, with uh, with LTE and cellular in that area, and. We included them here, although they're, they're not involving specifically an IETF protocol, that they've released a data set. So there's a, it could be the basis for other people to do research. And Anna's provided a link to the, um, the paper on archive as a presumably a, a preprint version of the paper. So give that a look uh, if you're interested in that technology. So, now I'm going to uh, hand it back to control back to Nina and she's going to walk us through those first set of presenters. So uh, coming up 
me stop sharing this screen. Yes, thank you so much, Dave. Um, that was a, a really interesting. I just need to know uh, who, who I need to make the presenter next. Let's see. Uh, next, we want to Massimo. invite Massimo. So if you can invite Massimo, the co-host, and we would like him to share his screen and give his presentation. Yes. So, okay, Massimo, you should be the presenter now. Perfect. Thank you very much. So are you able to see my uh, slides? Yes. Perfect. So hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Massimo Candela. I'm a senior software engineer at NTT. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this event uh, uh, because I personally really missed the uh, MAT working group at the last right meeting. So I'm really happy that we could do it uh, here. So um, uh, the presentation uh, here today, I will show you a mechanism uh, behind this uh, uh, service called Ripe IP Map, and also I will show you a performance evaluation we did it uh, together with the colleagues from uh, CADA. Uh, this is a paper that appeared in uh, the issue of two, uh, April 2020 of uh, Computer Communication Review. And, uh, well, let's start from uh, the beginning. The first thing is, uh, what is this uh, RIPE IP map? So RIPE IP map is a service that has been developed and is uh, offered uh, uh, by uh, RIPE NTC. And uh, it, it is essentially a service that you provide an IP address and uh, will try to uh, tell you where such IP address is geolocated. And, um, so the, a bit of, of history behind this service, the first uh, uh, attempt to tackle the uh, uh, geolocation topic uh, was presented in 2013 by uh, Emil. Uh, and uh, um, essentially he introduced the uh, OpenIP platform where you can use crowdsource data to uh, improve uh, IP geolocation. And in 2017, in another RIPE meeting, uh, I introduced instead a uh, uh, RIPE IP map, uh, which is uh, uh, the idea behind that is a, a, a system that has uh, the possibility to run various geolocation approaches and offer this platform to uh, uh, people that they want to provide a new geolocation system. So each geolocation approach runs in an isolated fashion. Uh, in something called geolocation engine that you can see in this uh, uh, chart at the bottom. And uh, uh, they produce some sort of geolocation in a uh, unified uh, output format and after they pass through a reducer step and the final answer is computed for the user. So each geolocation engine can do some stuff and for example, one of these is the crowdsource data uh, and another one can do active geolocation. And in particular, we are interested in one of the engine doing active geolocation. And in this presentation, we will study the uh, single radius uh, engine. So uh, a bit more of information. Um, I developed the single radius engine while I was a RIPE NCC and not anymore uh, RIPE NCC staff, uh, but we got some feedback that the system uh, uh, works and uh, there is also a paper that reports on a, a country accuracy of 99.58 uh, uh, for their use case. Uh, but we needed a formal study dedicated to the, uh, in particular to single radius and uh, in particular also to uh, city level geolocation and uh, also, the mechanism behind was not uh, for single was not formally described uh, uh, anywhere. So at some point, Kada decides to study single radius, and uh, the uh, uh, guy that you see here in the picture is Ben uh, that he presented at uh, RACI uh, first preliminary results. The study was uh, black box, so at some point they decided to. Uh, call me and uh, on board of the team to uh, essentially uh, provide more insight on how is work uh, is working uh, behind the scene the system. That's how I'm involved in this uh, research project. So the uh, just to uh, start with the what what is active geolocation? Uh, well, uh, simply like you want to geolocate an IP address, and uh, to do that you uh, take a host. 
that you know the location of, and you do a ping measurement to the target. In our case, the host is, uh, for example, RIPE Atlas uh, probes. And after you do a ping measurement, you know the latency, you get the latency, you transform it in a distance uh, with a coefficient factor usually expressing kilometers per millisecond. We will see it better later. And uh, uh, what you know is that the target IP is going to be around a specific area around your uh, source of the measurement. So like in this case, uh, the circle. So single radius uh, also the, as the name says, does exactly this um, plus some additional step. So the first thing is uh, there is a, uh, an initial selection of the probes. This is an important step because a lot of uh, methodologies, a lot of models describe they assume the possibility to select all the probes possible, but maybe are based on platforms that they have a couple of hundred probes, or anyway, they are developed uh, uh, not as a production service. And the main issue you have is that you cannot really select uh, in a serious platform like Red Patel, you cannot select like uh, 10,000 probes for geolocating one single IP, uh, because you will do essentially a DDoS every time, you would trigger a lot of ICMP rate limiting, you would just uh, also stress the platform itself. So there is an initial step that we will see for the selection. After you have the probes, uh, you do the ping measurements to the target. You select uh, a list, a single radius does that. You select the closest, the fastest of this uh, ping measurement. And uh, it has to be also the run through time below 10 milliseconds. We will also see uh, a bit better what this threshold is. And um, after you take this run through time and you convert in distance by doing run through time divided by two multiply for two thirds of the speed of light. So the run through time divided by two is the usual approximation that it's done to calculate the uh, one way delay, or at least as I said, an approximation of it. And the two thirds speed of light is the upper bound of the signal traveling in fiber, which assumes that between the source and the target, there is a straight fiber with no hop in between. And so they are really big approximation. Uh, the last step uh, is that single radius does tries to bring a bit more accuracy to the process is to select inside that circle, inside that uh, area, uh, 100 cities, uh, if there are at least 100, and um, it ranks them based on distance uh, from the source, number of facilities uh, and population, because the main goal of uh, RIPE PIMAP is to uh, geolocate infrastructure. So these parameters, they kind of give an indication of how much internet infrastructure there is in such city, cities. Um, all of this uh, methodology is described better in the article, but I uh, briefly show you just one detail is the uh, initial probe selection. Uh, Essentially, the goal here is that you don't know where the target is, uh, uh, but you can uh, um, select probes that they are topologically close, hoping that uh, they are also geographically close. At least that's the idea. And to do that, you can always do the target IP converted to autonomous system with IP2S lookup and use BGP topologies to uh, infer uh, uh, the topology and try to uh, select probes nearby. So uh, one thing that the uh, single radius does is selects uh, 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 like uh, BGP uh, neighbors, uh, uh, distance uh, one. And another thing that it does is it uses peering DB information to detect uh, which IXPs the autonomous system of the target is doing peering. So you detect the cities. This is uh, an idea that uh, initially introduced by uh, Vasilius that uh, you probably all know. And so at the end, uh, what you do is to have a set of cities and a set of um, 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 autonomous system, and you select, uh, you ask RIPE Atlas to select probes nearby, which sometimes it works. You uh, detect uh, the geolocation with one single probe. Sometimes you need up to 500, which is the up limit, but it's still anyway better than selecting all of them or select random. So uh, this was uh, the, the rest, as you saw, is uh, is essentially basic uh, uh, um, uh, basic active geolocation. Uh, more details are in the article, but uh, more or less we cover everything. So I'm going now to the part related to the evaluation. Uh, we evaluated the accuracy uh, compared with Maxmind and Attacity, which are the uh, leaders in this field. 
Uh, we evaluated the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of the probe selection method that I showed before. We evaluated the coverage. Uh, we evaluated also the rudder level consistency, where essentially we ask uh, uh, a single radius to geolocate uh, IP addresses belonging to the same router in, uh, by, in, and checking if we got the same essential geolocation. And uh, overall, the goal is to provide suggestion to Rev and CCA to the entire community. Um, the one in bold are the points that I'm going to describe now. So the first thing is uh, we need two data sets. One is for the ground, the ground truth data set is essentially uh, a collection of IP addresses of known location, and we need this to uh, uh, validate the accuracy. Um, we use the uh, ARC nodes, the NLNOG ring nodes, the MLAB uh, pods, and the ARC proximity data set. In this table, you can see the division of IPs uh, by region and also uh, coverage in terms of unique autonomous systems. And after we uh, filter out uh, um, the um, IPs that they have wrong metadata or they were offline, uh, so not possible to do geolocation, and we reported some cases of uh, uh, wrong or missed or corrupted uh, metadata to the uh, administrators of this platform. So this was also one of the um, benefit of this, uh, of this uh, exercise. So in the end, we had 968 IPs. And for the coverage data set, where we are not interested in having information about the uh, uh, geolocation itself, uh, but we need some responsive IP addresses, we use the uh, Manic interconnection data set produced by CADA, which has uh, more than 16,000 IP addresses um, uh, active and answering uh, things. So, go, uh, go straight to the accuracy results. We, uh, you see this uh, CDF. Um, the blue line is single radius. Uh, the orange one is net equity. The green is max mind. And you see on the X axis the error uh, in the geolocation in, term, in kilometers. So we consider uh, a distance below 40 kilometers uh, accurate at city level, a distance above 40 kilometers not anymore accurate at city level. This 40 kilometer is a threshold that is, uh, has been used multiple times in literature and uh, it's considered kind of average metropolitan area size. And we can see that uh, single radius outperforms the other two platforms and reaches uh, an accuracy that is 80.3%. Um, but uh, the comparison is not uh, yet uh, finished because if we compare the median 75th percentile and the 95th percentile uh, of the three platforms, uh, we see that, for example, for single radius is 626 and 344 kilometers of error, while for net equity is 1080 and almost 3000, and for max mine is 17278 and almost 3000 also. So uh, single radius even when uh, produce uh, uh, an answer that has an error above the 40 kilometers, so not any more accurate at city level for our uh, uh, parameter, produces anyway an error that is uh, uh, considerably uh, much smaller, like uh, uh, 300 kilometers compared to almost 3,000. Uh, but the problem, uh, okay, before to go to, uh, the 10 milliseconds threshold that we said before, we analyzed, uh, uh, how it would change because the threshold is essentially used in various works and the idea behind it is that if you have active measurement above 10 milliseconds the kilometer are so, are so much that it's not even worth to try to give a guessing of the geolocation that's the idea but we try to investigate what would happen if we would use geolocation a, a different threshold like uh, uh, from one to 10 milliseconds and uh, in particular here, I show the picture with two milliseconds, we have the 95th percentile uh, of city level accuracy. Of course, now the main project problem of active geolocation compared to the other systems is that uh, there is only a, a finite amount of answer you can give. Uh, so uh, active geolocation usually is not so good in terms of coverage compared to the other platform because the other platform can essentially provide uh, an answer, whatever it is, to whatever question you have. Uh, but with active geolocation, only some IPs are reachable or only some IPs are inside a certain boundaries of distance. Uh, so we use the MANIC uh, data set to uh, geolocate and uh, we find an answer for 78.5% uh, of the uh, 16,000 uh, IPs that were there. 
And uh, so this is uh, actually a, a, a good result in terms of uh, numbers. And uh, we also went to analyze, like we did before, what would happen if we would uh, make it more accurate. So if we would uh, change that threshold. So if you reduce the threshold from 10 to 5 milliseconds, we dropped the coverage to 51.1%. But if we uh, go to 2 milliseconds, where we would have a 95th percentile uh, uh, accuracy uh, at city level, uh, we have a coverage of only 24. So you do your math, if it's, you can do your tuning, if it's uh, convenient for you or not. Uh, uh, in my opinion, you basically drop, uh, you increase a 50%, 15% accuracy, but you lose a 55% coverage. So uh, I'm not sure uh, in how much uh, it is uh, worth in, in our uh, case. Um, so this is uh, uh, basically the uh, only part that I uh, want to show for today. Uh, but before to close, I want to just give some words about. I think it's always important to, important realize, to realize, realize. Yeah, it's always important to realize that um, yeah. every analysis that you do uh, related to platforms uh, uh, like uh, the one that uh, we saw before and related also to geolocation of us, uh, they have an intrinsic bias. Uh, induced by the fact that uh, the internet infrastructure is not distributed equally in the world. So in our research, we do also drill down for various regions and we try to uh, split uh, the various results. Uh, you see here uh, instead the, just the global view for uh, simplicity. Also, the ground truth data set of the IPs is really hard to obtain uh, such uh, accurate uh, set of IPs that you can uh, test and that you know exactly location. So this is also, uh, I mean, we had 968, which is a big amount compared to uh, a lot of other works, but uh, still a small amount compared to the entire address space. Uh, so I want to thank the uh, colleagues from uh, CADA, which are listed uh, here uh, for the uh, hard work and the uh, collaboration that we did. And uh, also, um, this is my uh, last slide, and if you have questions, this is the moment. I have also here my contact, so you can also contact me offline uh, if you would like. Thank you very That's much. Okay. Thank you for that, Massimo. And, and we do have uh, Jay Ignacio uh, in the queue with a question. So please Perfect. unmute yourself and ask her. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I, I would like to ask to Massimo uh, how many times uh, you need to get the, the location. And I have a second question is how many pings you need to send for every proof uh, to the, the, the location, the IP that you want to locate it. So I didn't get the first question. What, uh, so the second one, I got it. Uh, what was the first question? Sorry. Uh, how many times? Uh, because you have an IP, you, you run this system, and you, you spend some time to run the system because oh, to send the, okay. the measurement to the right address, uh, platform, you get times, it's not immediately. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so just don't have an idea how many times involves the full measurement for one IP. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, um, so to the amount of time um, uh, the uh, the um, uh, the system takes to geolocate, uh, it is set uh, on average about three minutes. Uh, so after three minutes, uh, uh, the API allows you to retrieve the data from Atlas and do the um the query uh, so uh, if you look at the measurement itself it could be faster but we don't want to uh, since our atlas has a queuing mechanism for the measurement we don't want to uh, retrieve data too early and give uh, a wrong answer so we wait the, the three minutes that we calculated as uh, basically the maximum time for a measurement to be a one-off measurement to be executed uh, so that the answer is is in general three minutes, but the uh, once an IP is uh, of course calculated, the answer is cached, so it will take milliseconds to just retrieve it uh, uh, okay. again. This is the uh, first um, answer uh, for the second question. So how many ping measurements? Uh, that depends on uh, the um, amount of probes that they were selected. Uh, so the probe selection mechanism. Uh, can uh, basically 
has a priority queue of uh, measurements to uh, probes to select based on the topology. Uh, so we can select one, but you can select up to 500. And uh, and after uh, basically you have a, a usual uh, ping with three attempts to uh, geolocate the, uh, the target. So that depends on the probe selected. Yes, but imagine that you get 100. You you got 100 pings, or every probe you send most, you send three pings, or this is my. Uh, it should be for for. Uh, Okay, so no, it, it is a one-off, so we send one-off, but each ping has three attempts, so three run-through time attempts. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very, yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, the next uh, question we have is from Daniel Karenbach, and he asked in the chat, did you outline, um, did you not mention the suggestions that you had to the right NCC, and, and what were they? Uh, no, the suggestion were uh, like uh, the experiment overall that we had for the uh, for the use of different thresholds. Uh, uh, we did a um, good amount of. Uh, uh, we have also a list of them. Um, they are more uh, in explicit uh, in the article. So we did various things, among which uh, the uh, graph that you see here uh, can be uh, used by the user to essentially tune their own. Uh, the API provides the round trip time used as a threshold, so you can use this to give uh, provide your own score. That is uh, one of the suggestions. Uh, the other suggestion that I have uh, for RIPE NCC uh, would be to, uh, at some point, implement a mechanism with multi -laturation. We did some uh, preliminary tests by using, uh, for example, regional uh, coefficient to uh, transform to distances, and the, uh, the results were uh, uh, extremely positive in terms also of reduction of ambiguity of the geolocation. But that would work uh, uh, with uh, a multilateration approach. And an all, another one uh, could be experimented is with the uh, removing the last mile, um, the last mile latency from uh, the measurement to improve the uh, uh, the, the accuracy. So uh, this is uh, uh, the overall, uh, um, I would say, high level summary of it. And um, yeah, uh, the. Uh, material is, is public, and I will uh, make sure that uh, uh, all detailed suggestions are um, delivered. Uh, by the way, this uh, research uh, ended up also with some patches that we did to the uh, IP map uh, source code itself, so uh, after the analysis. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Massimo. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, if you please stop sharing your uh, yes. screen. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, stop sharing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then we would like to invite Lesna to share your screen and do your presentation about the observations of during the pandemic. Okay. And I just switched Vesna to be the presenter, so she should be able to do that now. Excellent. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Vesna, I'm uh, from the RIPE NCC, I'm a community builder and I am giving this presentation on behalf of my colleagues, mainly Emil Aben who couldn't be here, but uh, these are his uh, slides mostly. So we have uh, been uh, active in uh, analyzing the data from uh, the RIPE NCC measurement projects and uh, publishing our findings on RIPE Labs. We have a collection on a slash COVID-19 and you can find all these results that I'm going to talk about uh, there. So uh, from the beginning, uh, other operators also contributed to this and also published some of their findings on uh, RIPE Labs. And we try to uh, move our real hackathon that we wanted to have to the virtual world and that worked more or less uh, as much as uh, possible so we um, also published some of the results of that hackathon there and some of the recommendations for the security regarding uh, covid uh, most of the applications for the tracking and so on so you can find uh, more of uh, information about our events also on rap labs 
we have basically two types of results. One is about the network stability based on the routing data that we collect, and the other one is about network delays. So the first one is based on uh, uh, so-called RIS or the Routing Information Service. And if you're not familiar with that, it is a little bit like the route views. And uh, I'm a, a bit sad to actually compare it to the other one, which is a competitor, but it's more well known, I guess. And it has a better name, I must admit. So uh, our service called RIS is uh, having a global view of the BGP. And so we have the routing collectors that are uh, listening to the routing updates, and we can show you either the history of the routing changes, or you can get uh, uh, the, the direct updates uh, as they happen. So there are multiple ways to access this data. And basically, this is an invitation for the other researchers and the network operators to use this data because it's open and it's very well documented how you can use it. So um, normally what you would use that for is uh, to uh, kind of troubleshoot your network and to show how is your um, uh, the wish performance actually different from what is happening in the world and maybe also to help you um, kind of combat some of the uh, root hijacks and takeovers. And all of that you can do by your own analysis, or you can uh, see our views on the stat.tribe.net. So when we looked uh, at the COVID uh, impact on the global BGP, we thought, well, it's going to um, flare up because people can't travel to their uh, distant points of presence to actually do the maintenance. And uh, there was uh, the restricted access to data centers. So we thought, oh, now this is going to actually um, explode, but we were wrong. So basically internet is stable, at least on the routing level. So this is um, the, the global view over time. And you can see that uh, in, uh, yeah, from November until July, so November last year until July this year, there weren't many changes. So um, the other way to look at it is by the type of the announcement. So either by adding the prefixes or removing the prefixes or the origin changes, again, there were some flares but it was nothing systematic and actually it didn't coincide too much with the lockdowns per country or anything because you could see that in December uh, of previous years actually there were uh, similar events. So our conclusions are that the pandemic didn't impact the internet on the global routing table level. So as usual we can see these uh, uh, weekly patterns and uh, so apparently all the operators are working very hard to maintain the internet now when it became even more important for even more people who are working remotely and and schooling remotely so if you want more details they are on uh, ripe labs and i do invite you to uh, actually analyze it on a more uh, granular level and to compare it with your own experiences and maybe come up with uh, different conclusions and then uh, the other type is uh, measure network delays by using RIPE Atlas. We uh, worked with uh, um, a researcher, Roma, who uh, made a very detailed analysis. And um, then um, he published that again on RIPE Labs. So this one actually uh, is, um, um, how can I call it, uh, uh, like a dashboard where you can choose a country and then we have uh, pre-coded some dates of the very clear lockdown uh, times per country and then looked at the month before and at that time the month after the lockdown to compare, but uh, now you can also get the, the latest data. And uh, so this is just a, a very quick overview per country and again you can put your own country uh, when analyzing data in your own way or a different time period. And so per country, we also show per a specific provider 
what were the uh, changes in latency. This is based on the RIPE Atlas data, so the pings, uh, the ping measurements. And so this is the, the RTT that you can see here. And again, um, there are some spikes for some providers, but for us looking from a distance, we couldn't really see a very clear reason why something will happen, but the people from a specific country probably can actually analyze it more related to their political situation or um, the lockdown details and so on. And so the other example is a little bit more busy when you just look at it as a, as a picture, as an illustration. And so there are much clearer differences from before the lockdown, during, and what is the situation now when the providers have actually increased uh, maybe their capacity or found a way to deal with uh, the increased load. So there are conclusions to be drawn here, but we didn't go into the very specific details ourselves. This is more to show what can be, what is possible and to give like a very quick overview per country. How does uh, RIPE Atlas see the networks uh, and how they are impacted with the, the uh, heightened usage? So, the good news is internet is doing fine. And uh, if you would like to explore it yourself, uh, here are the links to the interface and to the projects that I mentioned. So, uh, this is something that I added since I've sent the slides. Uh, this is not in the slides that I uploaded, so pay very close attention. Uh, we also uh, opened some uh, weeks ago a community projects fund call for suggestions. So, uh, RIPE NCC is uh, uh, decided some years ago to start funding the projects that are for the good of the internet. So, the main criteria is that they are based on the open source and the open data. And so, uh, the projects that contribute to the resilience or sustainability uh, of the internet can receive money. And uh, we have already uh, highlighted some of the winners from the previous project fund uh, on the RIPE Labs. And for this year, you still have a few days, a few weeks to apply. So, please approach your communities and spread the news because we would like to support the existing projects or the new ideas that work on the good of the internet. Contact us if you have any questions. There are my email addresses, emails, and a lot of uh, Twitter details and uh, RIPE Labs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Meshna. And um, we have a couple of questions. So first, I'd like to invite Jay Ignacio again. Uh, please make sure. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, thanks for for the presentation. Um, I I have been doing also measurements in Latin America and using right Atlas. Here the problem is we have a few groups uh, among uh, 400 spread in Latin America. Some countries have very few and so on. But um, we we try to identify, we, we concentrate in Argentina, I am from Argentina, to concentrate, to identify the, the path, the routes uh, through the CDNs, just to most used CDNs, which are the, 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 the where dominates the traffic into internet. And uh, after that, we perform some measurements, basically, Trace route because we want to, to to analyze the 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 traffic inside different parts of the network. Um, we we just see the, the results. Uh, not not so much uh, analyzed for for the moment because we we need people to do that, and it's a little busy moment at, at, at that time because the, the pandemic makes so complicate everything. And but uh, the the main um, the, the first results are that in some specific time you perhaps you 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 got some some congestion in 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 some IXP not not exactly into the IXP but in the in the in the some um, some I'm specific. Sorry. 
I'm sorry. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, I I just just finish uh, the. But but yeah. for the, the problem yeah. is perhaps you uh, you you need to to analyze the the the, the or, or perhaps it's, it's possible to analyze the the information deeper. And uh, if you want, I can send an email with the details. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would be interested. And if you publish something, we can republish that on Ripe Labs and the promote in our community. And then maybe you can get somebody to cooperate with you and help you out. And another comment on this is in the regions where we have fewer probes, it, it might be possible to install the so called software probes. I have posted the link in the chat, and that's just easier from the logistics point of view. So please uh, consider that. Yes, thank you. Very good idea. Thank you so much. Uh, and the next one we have uh, uh, is Dave. Y yes. Dave, take it away. Uh, thank, thanks, Vesna. Um, I, I noticed in a couple of your slides you had, for instance, details like 18th of March, uh, Belgium went a lockdown. Um, I was wondering what, what do you have uh, as a resource in terms of a journal or what advice do you have for the rest of us that might want to study this? on how to find real world events um, about when those lockdowns happened. And also presumably the challenge is gonna get even worse as we get more and more waves and changes with lockdowns. What, what have you found? Yes, so uh, this was the first attempt to, to work on this and uh, uh, it was quite early in the, um, and then we were hopeful that there will be one lockdown, one date per country. <laughs> and then later on, we realized like, uh oh, that was not uh, uh, so obvious. So uh, the first uh, thing is that we actually consulted the Wikipedia page, which lists per country when was the lockdown date, like a, a third party neutral resource. And then currently there is an idea, or at least this is my wish, to change this to, to make it into a monthly report so that we just look at a, whatever, a fixed date in a month per country, and then we can see what the changes are regardless of the actual lockdown date, because it's going to become fuzzy anyway with uh, the new lockdowns and the second waves and N plus one waves. I, I see, and the Wikipedia page was uh, specifically about the overall COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, uh, it is listed in that uh, article by Roma, uh, oh. where we have looked up the dates, but he had to actually hard code those dates per country. And that's a lot of manual work. So I think if we were to automate this to the next level, it should just be easier than that. Uh, okay, thank you. Unless somebody has a better idea, so we can work on this later on um, offline, online, but not on this WebEx. Right, right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vashna. Uh, that was really cool. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Lai. Lai, is that, I hope that's the correct pronunciation of your Lai, hi, hi. Uh, Lai, thank you very much. Give, give me a minute to make Lai the presenter and we'll be, there you are. Okay, you should be, you should be ready. Uh, You're presenting now and you can share your, your slides. Great. And we can see them. Yes. Okay, great. So, hi, my name is Lai Olson. I'm the project director of Measurement Lab. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, similar to Vesna, uh, we're here, or I'm here to uh, just share the fact that our data exists and um, give an overview of how it's generated so that um, researchers here can, can take it and run with it. Um, so talking about what is MLAB, um, just to speak briefly about the, the goals of our project. Um, some of you may be already familiar, so apologies if so, but for those of you who haven't been introduced, uh, our mission is to measure the internet, save the data, and make it universally accessible and useful. I am preaching to the choir that there are many ways to do this, and by no means do we claim to do all of them, but we do focus on principles of openness and transparency. So. All of our data um, is open and free to access, um, and I'll talk more about how that works. Um, I always think it's useful to, when talking about measure, measurement lab as a project, to think about um, the problems that it was trying to solve. Uh, the project was started in 2008, so it's been around for 12 years, um, and it was responding to a widely reported problem of not being able to, not having access to commercially uh, maintained 
servers that were widely deployed enough um, with and with ample connectivity to support the kind of experiments that internet researchers wanted to perform. And then another issue that it's trying to solve is the issue of big data sets and being able to um, uh, share the data that these experiments um, are producing. Um, so these are the two kind of problem sets that the project set out to solve. And then if you fast forward 12 years, we have um, a platform um, that I'll talk more about, a pipeline that archives all of the data that the platform, um, that the, the experiments generate, and um, then the data itself that we make publicly available. Um, we also maintain a, a suite of tools that are focused on community-based data collection and um, we, of course, also try and foster a community, um, which like ripe to get researchers involved um, in, in using our data. Um, our team is based at Code for Science and Society, which is an open data and open science um, fiscal sponsor. Uh, we also have um, Google as a core contributor. And one of the things they do to contribute is they uh, donate the time of a, a team of software engineers. So our team is made up of two organizations um, of core contributors. So getting into the, um, the nitty gritty of how the platform works, um, just to give a sense, the, uh, currently we host about um, uh, 500 or so servers in 60 plus metro areas and off-net service providers. Um, and for us, off-net, we define as tier one data centers um, where uh, the, they're serving more content than people. Um, so essentially outside of access networks. Um, on these servers, we host measurement services, and uh, they're the, basically the server side code, then clients are developed to run tests against them. So um, we see this as measuring the inter part of the internet, um, going past the, uh, the eyeball network, so to speak, and um, having the clients test against servers that are within the backbone. Um, Anyone can develop clients, so our the the server side experiments are approved are uh, mostly written by academic researchers and approved by our experiment review committee. But anyone can write this, the client side code. Um, one example is uh, the Uni application runs an NDT test, and we'll talk more about NDT. Uh, the, the Google search client as well is one of the integrators. Um, so if you Google how fast is my internet, we are what pops up. Um, or in the NDT test that is hosted on MLab is what pops up. Um, by nature of NDT being on the project the longest, we have the most um, data for that test or for that measurement service. And so um, often when you hear about MLab data, we're actually probably talking about NDT data. Um, and so and for that reason, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, these slides are kind of my standard slides. So I get into a lot of nuances here that actually maybe folks here are more familiar with than most. Um, but to break it down just briefly, um, NDT, uh, which is one of the measurement services that we host, um, is uh, uh, measuring the single stream performance of bulk transport capacity. Um, bulk transport capacity is trying to um, look at the, the reliability or the, the ability to uh, deliver packets reliably across that link. Um, just have some notes here about um, how often this term is conflated with link capacity. I feel like this is the audience that understands the, the difference, but um, it suffice to say often both are conflated with speed. Um, and so it's often thought of as a, as a speed test. Um, it's also measuring the single stream performance as a way to effectively measure the baseline of um, uh, the bulk stream or sorry, the bulk uh, transport capacity. Um, and put these together and you get NDT. And so um, a question that we often get from, from kind of end users is why is my you know, speed test different than other speed tests? And it's just an overview of uh, what NDT specifically is trying to measure. Um, and then in combination with our off net platform, that's um, giving you a vantage point outside of the access network. This is, um, these are uh, the, the characteristics of the, the MLab data set or um, more specifically the NDT data set. Um, one thing to note is that NDT 7, which we're actually in the process of migrating the majority of our clients to, supports um, BBR, so um, has a, a better ability to uh, model the network um, that it's basing, basing its congestion control off of. Um, it also runs over TLS and uses modern web sockets and actually 
uh, today we're releasing a blog post um, talking about the uh, comparisons between um, NDT7 and NDT, NDT5, our previous protocol. Um, and there's some links there too, if you're um, wanting to know more about either BBR or NDT7. Um, you can also run your own NDT server, just as a, as a side note, if that's interesting to anyone. This is the same thing that we run on our um, OffNet platform. Um, you can run that same, that same server side code on any uh, machine that uses Docker. Um, uh, these are more slides about uh, our, our other uh, measurement services that I encourage you to look at um, in the slides that I uploaded. Um, but the, the main thing that I wanted to get at, if there's like one thing that I can communicate today is that there is a ton of this data um, and it has been being collected through all through the pandemic and longer uh, for, 10, for 12 years to be specific. Um, and as of today, about 3 million new NDT measurements are um, uh, added per day or um, produced per day. Um, and as of 2020, we're close to 2 billion rows of NDT um, uh, rows in our NDT table. Um, through the pandemic as well, more people are testing, more people are home, more people are trying to figure out what's going on with their connection. Um, and we have been able to, I mean, you can see almost double the size of testing. Um, this is just the US, but uh, this has been a, a, a common um, behavior across uh, countries. So there is more data than ever. Um, and I think the, the, uh, the takeaway here is that we would, we really invite researchers to to um, join us in analyzing it. And uh, we, uh, we don't have a research team, so um, we would love to work with you to support uh, your research and your use of this data. Um, just going through some of the uh, other slides, these are just getting at that it's um, all open and free, and I'll actually go on to um, the, what, the slides about accessing the data. So. Um, the most common way is through our visualization site. Um, uh, I'm not going to exit out of the presentation, but if you go to that site actually right now, there's um, uh, data studio dashboards um, that make it really easy to just piece through um, what uh, country you're interested in, as well as what city um, and ASN and, um, and look at the data through the pandemic um, week by week. Um, there's also, but the most, uh, the next most popular way of accessing the data and probably for most folks here who are look, interested in looking at low, lower level metrics, um, is to use BigQuery uh, and that's just a, a sign up on our, on, um, our discuss mailing list and you can get a login and it's free to, free to run queries as well. Um, so if there's any questions on, uh, uh, how to access that, we're always here at support at measurementlab.net, um, to support, uh, your your analysis. Um, I think I'll just close by talking about just uh, even outside of the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, I, we're really interested in engaging with this group specifically actually. So this is a really great opportunity to be introduced to you all. And I would defer to uh, your expertise in terms of how we can be useful or how we can contribute to this working group. Um, some ideas, uh, if you are part of a, of, um, a service provider, we'd uh, be happy to talk to you about pod sponsorship um, for extending our platform. Um, also, our, as I think I mentioned a little bit, the, um, the, the platform, uh, the, the experiments that run on it are approved by our experiment review committee, but we're open to any um, experiment that is open source. So if you have an experiment that would scale um, well on the MLAB platform and benefit from um, using it as well as generating open data. Um, that's something we're really interested in talking about um, specifically with this group. Um, and I think, again, the invitation is to um, please use the MLAB data um, and uh, let us know how we can make it more useful to you. Um, and uh, here are some examples actually of, um, of the researchers that have uh, used it so far uh, to analyze the COVID-19 impact. Um, one is uh, Roman, which uh, uh, Vesna talked about earlier, and then um, also a researcher with UNI um, who uh, looked at the network performance in Italy. And so I'll, I'll uh, pause there for questions or end there for questions. Great. Thank you, Lyle. Um, we do not have any questions in the, uh, in the chat. Um, there's a there's a discussion about the previous presentation. 
Um, and I wonder if that is something that we want to we want to talk about now, or we want to push that to to an offline discussion at some later point. Um, Should probably um, take that one offline. Yeah, we're just yeah. about on schedule right now. Yep. Uh, yeah. so, so if we, I, I bet we might have some time, uh, uh, before the meeting ends, which I'm happy to come back to it. Um, otherwise we'll do it on the mailing list. Great. So I'm going to make my, myself, a, uh, Nina, I'm sorry. Do, are you done there? Uh, I think we want to, I think we want to put Robert on the spot. Exactly. Um, yeah. It so we noticed out. that. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank it you. Actually out that Robert, Robert joined the, joined the meeting. So, and, and then he found out that he was set to present. So, uh, kindly enough, he's going to, he's going to give us a, a, a small update on the current state of the, the right NCC tools. So, if you can please, um, Dave, make Robert Sturkey. Sure, or he's, sure. he's going to do it verbally. So, I don't, there will be no slides. Yeah, I have no slides. So, okay. If they can hear me anyway, then I don't. Yeah, we can to. hear you. Just okay. yeah, just go ahead. Thanks, Robert. Excellent. So yes, thank you very much for for um, putting me on the spot here, um, but it's fine. Um, I unfortunately will not have slides to to um, show you what I'm talking about, but still, probably I will try to be coherent. Um, so this is the Ripe NCC tools update, and I usually begin with um, Ripe Atlas. It's um, still stable and, and still growing. We at the moment are floating around um, 10,000 results per second coming in to the system. So that's um, a lot of result data from all over the world. Um, we have about 11,000, a bit more than 11,000 end devices that, that we call probes. Um, and we also have 600, 650 Ripe Atlas anchors, um, which are somewhat bigger machines that you can also target um, if you are if you want to measure something and you're looking for a, a target in the network. Um, now, this is a lot of data that we're collecting. So um, one of the um, feedback that we got recently, um, or I should say continuously, is that if you really want to work with all of that data, that's relatively hard. So what we are doing nowadays is um, putting all of that data, or almost all of that data, onto uh, Google BigQuery, um, somewhat similarly than Measurement Lab does. Um, and we plan to open that up to the whole world, to the research community in, in particular, um, so that you can get access. And with the BigQuery interface, you can really, really dig deep and very quickly into um, details if you want to. So that's um, ongoing. And I expect that we can make some announcements um, soon, probably or hopefully before the next writing. If not, then the one after, um, meaning everyone uh, can have access to all of that data. Um, this is in addition to the way we present and make our data available to the community anyway on the labs platform. It's just making it easier for anyone to, to analyze that. Um, as you may have heard from Vesna, we're working on um, what we call software probes. So these are basically software packages that you can deploy anywhere you want on your home router or, or your web server or your any kind of server um, that basically acts as a Ripe Atlas probe. It does exactly the same thing, um, except that you don't need to deploy the hardware itself. So in some situations, especially if hardware is difficult to ship to a target, um, this can come really handy. So um, Vesna posted the link, but it's relatively easy to find anyway. Um, if you want to jump on, you can do this. We're still supporting uh, the hardware probes, and we don't have any plans currently to stop supporting them. So don't worry. If you want to have a hardware probe, you can still apply for one, and you will eventually get one. Um, we are working on improving the, the actual measurement software. Um, there are some new measurements coming up, and we're trying to improve the existing measurements. So it has been pointed out to us, for example, that the trace route measurements could be more efficient, which is on the agenda uh, for us now. Um, the VM anchors are still growing. We are doing some lifecycle replacements. As you can imagine, if you deploy your hardware every now and then, you have to refresh that. And these are rec-mounted PCs, so every now and then that needs to be done. Um, somewhat interestingly, 10 years of Ripe Atlas is coming up. Um, it's, it's surprising even to me that we've been doing this for 10 years, but it's almost 10 years now. Um, the exact date is um, October, end of October or mid-November, depending on which number you want to look at. So what you can expect is that we are going to do some small gimmicks, um, interesting tidbits of, of information, um, and some some celebratory tweets and uh, pages that we can put up. Um, 
I think that for a measurement platform, 10 years is a lot. And um, I'm sure measurement lab is, is also in this ballpark. Um, and also if for this event, you would like to um, appear and um, show us what you did with Ripe Atlas. So if you can have something like a testimonial that you think was, is worth sharing with others, then please reach out to us uh, on the usual channels and we'll try to um, include you in, in um, the information that we will put out. Um, also, if you would like to sponsor Atlas, that's always possible. Um, right to that, that's one of the tools that has not been mentioned today um, just yet. So that's our um, resource explanation service. If you ask, what do you know about an AS number or an IP prefix or an address, then we will spit back a whole lot of information about geolocation, routing, DNS, and so on. Um, this service receives uh, more than 100 million queries a day, um, all of which require some number crunching on our end. So that's that's a challenge to keep up, but the team is um, luckily very agile on that one. So they, they are really trying to do their best to do this. Um, the user interface will be revamped um, probably uh, still this year, maybe early next year. So we will have something that's nicer uh, and works better on the mobile platforms, which may more and more and more people ask. So if you want to know something about an IP address uh, on the road, you can do that very quickly. Um, IP map that has been mentioned both by Massimo and I think also by uh, Vesna. Um, indeed, uh, we're still working on that. And as Massimo mentioned, um, this, the system's point is to provide infrastructure geolocation information by combining multiple inputs to such a question, uh, which, we, which we call engines. So the engines work independently, they, they make their own decisions about what they think that particular IP address is, and then the system presents a unified output of that. Um, the, uh, the engine that Massimo described is one of those, um, uh, but we're still working on more of those to make it more useful for people. Um, RIS has been mentioned by Vesna as well. So that's our routing information service. Um, there is some internal thinking about, you know, what's next for RIS. Um, and we, we really want to cooperate with people who actually want to cooperate with RIS as well. So both in terms of peering with RIS, providing data to the system, but also um, running route collectors if you're so inclined. Um, that's one of the features that we would like to explore a bit more. Um, one of the features that I would like to mention here is, um, which which is um, RIS Live, which is basically the streaming um, access to the RIS data set, which is real-time access to the data that we have. Um, and Massimo, in his other working time, has been working on some alerting tools based on uh, um, the RIS Live data. So if you're interested in um, real-time routing information and um, anomaly detection and so on, then I encourage you to check out this live and the BGP alerter tool that Massimo has built. Um, and in other news, we have an, an arm that um, does research within the, the RIPE NCC. Um, Vesna mentioned a couple of examples, uh, and one more is coming up uh, at the end of this session. So that's measuring about uh, 2 a 10 slash 12 uh, in the IPv6 space. But in general, if you want to be up to date about what kind of interesting information we found or are looking at, uh, you can always just look at RIPE Labs um, and we will publish most or all of our researches there. So I'm hoping that I was more or less coherent um, and you could follow. Um, and if you have any questions, then by all means, um, contact us right here, right now or on the usual channels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. That was. Uh... That was incredible on the spot like that. <laughs> well done. Um, we, should, we should surprise you more often. That was a, that yeah. was a great tool update. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> great. Um, and this was actually the end of the, of the, of the right, um, MIT working group um, part of the program. So I'm going to hand over to Dave, uh, who will take you through um, the next part of the of the session today. Thank you so much. All right, can you hear me? No. Yes. Oh, you can. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, th thanks for joining us during your holiday, uh, Robert. Um, I think I take better holidays than you. The the um, 
Uh, this is the intellectual property rights uh, statement uh, to just to notify uh, the following presenters. If you have IPR claims regarding your work uh, to disclose them in a timely fashion. Um, what we, so we're, we're running about 10 minutes uh, later than we thought we would, but that's good because we thought we would need an extra 10 minutes. So we should be able to fit this in time. These are the upcoming presentations that uh, Miria and I um, uh, arranged for the measurement analysis for protocols research group. Um, and Mark is up first and Mark has asked me to run the slides for him. So I'm going to stop sharing this and start sharing that one. And Mark, are you there? Are you ready? I think I might have to unmute Mark. All right. Oh, no, I still see Mark is muted. There we go. And share want preview this guy. To view. All right. Uh, take it away, Mark. Uh, we can't hear you. Can't hear you, Mark. Stop sharing that for a second so I can go back and see. Mark, uh, you're shown as unmuted in the participants list for me. Um, unmuted now. Try one more time. Yeah, I can't hear you. Um, why don't you try uh, uh, disconnecting and reconnecting to the WebEx and um, and we'll switch to, uh, I think, the next presentation in the meantime and come back to you. Does that make sense? I think he said, okay. So let's see who, so, to, so who do we have up next? I think it's Jake. Jake, are you ready to go? Yep, I can go. Okay, let, let, let me make you the presenter. Hold on a sec. All right, Jake should be the presenter now. Um, take it away, Jake. Okay, I will. Uh, all right, you can see my slides, I hope. And hear yep. me? Yep, we can see it. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Jake Holland. I work for Akamai. Um, I'll be talking about some uh, observations about latency and AQM that I started in about February. Um, I'll go over a little bit of the uh, background and goals behind what I was aiming for here. Uh, a couple of somewhat tentative conclusions that I have from the observations I've made, and uh, just give a little pitch for, you know, uh, I, I'm mostly looking for a collaborator here uh, because I'm probably not going to do a whole lot more with this unless uh, unless there's interest. But I think that the uh, just because it's not very actionable for us um, from where we're sitting as Akamai, but um, but I think there's some worthwhile stuff in this data that that could bear some uh, some improved um, uh, analysis. Uh, if anybody can be enticed into uh, into hooking up with me, uh, I put a bunch of stuff in the backup slides also. So if there's more you want to know, take a look through those. This is uh, we enabled ECN uh, in February, um, and so we started looking at what we can see now that ECN is enabled. Uh, in some sense, I'm using um, observation of a CE mark as a proxy for um, for existence of an AQM. Uh, I know that's a, a lower bound. Uh, we, you know, many AQMs do not uh, do marking, but um, but I nonetheless. Did a little bit of comparing between uh, AQM and not within the same ISPs, um, and there were a few questions I wanted to get at first, which were uh, how much are we seeing ECN usage and utilization, and uh, the key one which we did consider possibly actionable was uh, whether home router solutions can 
uh, really address the problem or not. Um, we were looking for whether we can get it down to a reliable 45 milliseconds uh, to support end-to-end -end gaming. Um, and for that reason, this is not really, I was, I'll get into uh, what I was looking looking at there when I get to, to that bit of it, but uh, just put a pin in that. Um, and, and my time to work on this was pretty limited, but uh, so there might be some interesting yet unaddressed questions. Uh, so my first conclusion is that CE marking is not very prevalent. I'm seeing uh, now about um, about 0.3% prevalence uh, last March when, uh, the, you know, after most of the shutdowns had begun, but uh, before I had done a lot, uh, um, you know, also after we started being able to, to see the data, uh, it was closer to 0.02%. Um, I think we're probably seeing some ISP managed adoption. I'll uh, go over a little bit why I think that. Uh, this was partially inspired by a prior talk. There's links in the slide, in the slides. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Apple's talk from a few years ago. Um, but we're measuring from the server side, uh, and we're basically looking only at the downstream. Um, and I organized it by ASN instead of by country, um, because it seemed more meaningful after kind of looking at it. Uh, if you follow the slides, you'll see that it had a big uh, observation in Argentina, but that was later discovered to be uh, not relevant. So um, I, I was looking to see if I could replicate this, by the way, and I couldn't really. Um, and I think part of this is because we're getting a different view on the on the marking, um, because uh, when you're the client trying to download something, then when you you get a better chance to see if uh, if there was any congestion ever uh, to that client than than we do from the server side because we only will see congestion uh, some of the time. Uh, especially if we are not actually inducing congestion, which often we don't. Um, so here's a chart. What we're looking at here is the uh, proportion of the clients that ever asked for ECN that actually saw CE marks and uh, sorted by, uh, by ASN. Um, and then this, the size of the ASN corresponds to the size of the data point. Uh, so this is just the top uh, 35 or so uh, ASNs, and you can see that it drops off quite quickly. There's a few ASNs that seem to have deployed something uh, clearly managed by the ASNs that are sort of up in the, or by the ISP that's, you know, up in the 80, 90 percentile uh, per, uh, percent of clients uh, who ask for, C, for ECN do sometimes see marks during a day. Um, and, uh, but it drops off pretty quickly. Uh, there's a sort of middle ground here. Um, so, you know, here at, at 3% or so, it's still quite about uh, you know, 10 times higher than the, than the global uh, typical count. Um, so I'm not totally sure what to make of this, but my guesses are written here on the slide. I, I think that um, you know, for these larger ISPs that are seeing, uh, you know, 7% of paths uh, or of client IPs do sometimes see the mark. Uh, because it's, it's uh, quite a lot more uh, people than, um, than you might otherwise guess. Uh, the smaller ones, uh, so the, the largest dot on this chart is uh, 103K client IPs in the ASN, and the smallest is, uh, is 510. So some of these tiny ones are, um, are really pretty small. Uh, there's another filter I didn't mention here. Uh, this also is a little bit covered in the backup slides. There's, uh, 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 I, I'm filtering for ISPs that had at least 100 clients that ever asked for ECN. Um, and uh, so even in the 500 IPs, 
we have at least 100 uh, clients that, that sometimes ask for ECN. But uh, so the 3% that you're seeing here could be as low as three uh, for a very small, uh, you know, three individuals for a very small IP. So I don't think that's particularly uh, indicative of anything. Um, it also should be noted that the, what we can see is a lower bound. So these are, uh, these are connections that at, or client IPs that actually on some of their connections did CCE marking. Um, and uh, so there's the July line and the March line. Uh, you can see that between March and July, it increased quite a bit and that we get um, a lot more in the way of large ISPs that have done something. Um, you know, the, uh, however, that said, it remains quite small overall. Um, this also does not represent most of the CE marking paths on the internet. Uh, these are the top ISPs that seem to be doing something with it. Um, but if you look at the top, uh, 100, so the, you know, you, it continues down to a smaller, uh, long tail here, but, um, but out of the top 100, uh, of the you know 800 or 1,000 ISPs that, that pass the filters, uh, that only represents 1 40th of the CE marking paths on the internet. So, um, so I'm concluding that most CE paths on the internet are not ISP managed. Most of them are uh, probably these home router kind of deployments uh, that are widely available. Um, but, uh, but of the ones that are ISP managed, um, you know, there's there's not that many, but they seem to be growing somewhat. Um, the reason I'm distinguishing between ISP managed and not is because we we're interested in the question of whether a home router deployment uh, would be able to address the um, the uh, the latency issue uh, mostly, or whether it really would need something done by the ISP. And my tentative conclusion here is that it probably needs something done by the ISP. It's not good enough to do it uh, in home routers predominantly. Um, so what I'm looking at here is uh, the, the samples that I'll be presenting are all uh, just the, the SYN to the, the SYN act to the ACK. So this is just a snapshot, one per connection that's right when the, when the connection opens. And um, I'm not uh, saying anything about um, the home router's AQM impact on, on self-congestion during an active TCP flow. Um, I'm looking for mostly like what you would see in a gaming scenario where you've got a lot of uh, chatty back and forth, but not a great deal of bandwidth. Um, and I, I took uh, the TCP handshake as a decent proxy for this, for this kind of measurement. Um, so, uh, uh, and what I'm seeing is that CE marking paths still experience a, a pretty high uh, latency variation according to the, to the ASM that they're in, uh, that, that is different depending on which ASM, which ASM they're in. Uh, where is my... So the, the charts I'm showing are um, for one day of data. I was doing one day at a time just partly because of the way it's partitioned for uh, for my access. Uh, this covers, um, uh, I, I've done done this separately on a few different days, but not in a really, uh, you know, consistent and organized way. Uh, so I just sort of did spot checks for consistency between days and, and kind of qualitative uh, judgment of the, of the done any like putting the days together to make good sense out of them. Um, so I, I picked two particular ASNs to, to go over. Uh, these are chosen to be just sort of um, from the kind of leading edge and from the middle of the pack of the ASNs I had available. Um, and uh, and also I wanted to give a shout out to uh, um, the presentation also a couple of years ago about, uh, I, I think it it uh, got me thinking about the right way to do that. Links there, that's a good one. Um, so what I filtered for, I was looking for the, uh, trying to, to isolate the effect on the access network. So as a CDN that has a, a large edge deployment, 
uh, we were looking for like what is the impact that we cannot address by sort of mapping better or or having more edge servers out there. Like what are we going to be seeing, even if we do the everything perfect on the server side? Um, and I'm looking for the latency span. So I took uh, only client IPs where I had at least 50 samples uh, from the same data center to the same client IP uh, in the same day. And I topped it out at 300 samples from any data center to the client IP. Uh, and the reason for that is to exclude um, carrier grade, grade NATs and VPNs, which have uh, you know, a very wide variety of, of paths. Um, and again, in the backup slides, there's a chart that shows like why I think 300 is about the right cut. Um, the uh, and all of the client IPs that made it into the end had a, a uh, at least one RTT sample that was uh, 20 milliseconds or below. Um, so after these filters, I get about uh, 5.3 billion samples uh, across 31 million client IPs. Um, there's 11 million of these client IPs that uh, ever negotiated ECN and um, 33,000 of them that ever saw marking. Uh, so the, the data, also one other point to make is that I talk about client IPs because that's kind of an easier way to think about it. But each of these, uh, each of the points in the charts is actually looking at a data center to client IP pair. So there might be multiple different data centers that talk to the same client IP, but um, it, but those would show up as separate uh, points in the chart. But the same client IP cannot appear more than six times uh, and probably not more than five because it would not have passed the filters if it did that. Um, so I, I'll be, the charts say pairs, but I'll be talking probably about client IPs instead. Uh, so the, the quote good ISP. Uh, this is kind of what I see. So there's there's eight uh, different CDFs here essentially, um, and what they are is the solid line is the 50th percentile uh, of the client IPs span uh, of the latency span they observed over the over the day. So however many samples they had, you know we've got a client IP that's that's. Uh, was in the middle here, and their 50th percentile was uh, had an RTT that was, you know, at this value. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, and then we have the same chart for the 75th percentile, the 91st percentile, and the 98th percentile. Um, so, as I said, each client IP, each of these, uh, each of the points on this chart has at least uh, 50 samples. So we've thrown out at least one. Um, and uh, uh, at least the top outlier. Um, but these 98th percentiles uh, values of the, of the latency span for the client IP, then each of those clients uh, would, would represent some point on this chart. Um, and another point worth noting is that the same client might have you know, a 98th percentile up here and a 91st percentile down here. They're not necessarily uh, the same client all the way across. Uh, the only real restriction would would be that uh, within the client, it's it's monotonic. Um, but so given that, uh, what we've got is uh, the the uh, the green charts are the uh, baseline. So that's all of the uh, all of the data points within that ASN, and the blue ones are just the CE marking paths. Whether or not those two mark, any client IP that ever in the day saw a CE mark is uh, included in the blue chart. Um, so you can see that this is um, this is what about 0.2% uh, 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 ish of of the uh, uh, of the uh, IPs that were in the that were in the filter. So these are all within the same ASN. And um, uh, one interesting thing to note is that in this case, it looks like some of the CE marked, um, uh, some of the CE marking paths actually had a worse uh, 98th percentile than, than the uh, overall paths. 
Uh, I'm not sure if that's selection bias or if it's uh, an artifact from um, running an AQM. But this represents an ISP where we think it's not, there's not an ISP managed uh, marketing deployment. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, these are, these are the kinds of numbers I have for this. I have uh, probably, what, 1,500 of these charts, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I just picked one out to, to be illustrative here. Um, uh, per day that I run. So um, a middle ISP is just chosen from the middle of the pack according to their 91st and 98th percentile. And this is about what we see there, where the it's the same thing, but the uh, the pink line is the e-marking and the orange line is, uh, is the overall uh, latency uh, spans that we see. Um, and the, the conclusion comes from, if you just look at the overall values of the good ISP versus the middle ISP, uh, it's pretty clear that this is, um, you know, being in the good ISP is dramatically better than doing CE marking in the middle ISP. Um, so this is pretty typical. It's not universal. Uh, and again, I have a, another uh, chart in the backup slides of a different middle ISP where it was a better, uh, a better value for marking CE, uh, for CE marking paths. Uh, but this is sort of the evidence that I'm using to conclude that we cannot solve the latency problem by doing home router deployments. Uh, so for, you know, where do I want to take this next? Um, I feel like there's a lot of unexplored questions in this data, uh, but it's, uh, you know, I, I had to tell my corporate overlords here that um, I could easily spend six months or a year digging on this and come out with no uh, concrete recommendations for what we should actually do in our network. And so I'm basically dropping this unless somebody uh, reaches out to me and, and is interested in developing this further. Um, so yeah, do that if you think it should be developed further and you have some ideas on how to do so. I uh, just wanted to uh, get that out there and let people know kind of what things we're seeing. And I will take questions if there are any. All right, thanks, Jake. Yeah, there are a few. Uh, we've got three questions for you that um, I'm going to ask on the questioner's behalf. Um, Bob Briscoe uh, first asked the question back on, on your slide five. Um, you were showing C marking prevalence, and Bob asked, um, uh, Is there any check um, in your work? to look to, to determine if it's real ECN marking and not um, field mingling. I did do some spot checks. Um, you know, there's there's a few uh, points of evidence that that I have. Um, I, I don't it's not great evidence. Uh, I, I looked for any uh, any CE or um, or ECN markings on paths that did not negotiate uh, CE or ECN markings. And I never saw any of those uh, over the span that I looked for them. Um, ah, okay. You know, I'm Excellent. not sure that there's, uh, I'm not sure that it never happens. Uh, obviously it, it, you know, these things could happen and now that I've mentioned it, maybe they'll start happening, who knows? But uh, nobody was doing this uh, as far as I could ever see during the time I was, I was looking at this. Um, I don't have, uh, you know, if you're talking about um, the kinds of, of uh, traffic that was reported previously where uh, ECN marks were happening on every packet or something, uh, no, that also was definitely not happening. Uh, most of the time what we're seeing is a small number of, um, of flows ever get CE marked, even in the, uh, even on the paths they're doing uh, highly prevalent CE markings. Um, but uh, uh, we did not observe a lot in the way of, um, you know, we're, we're relying on the, on the client heuristics that Apple talked about for uh, when they see a, a problem uh, in, where like every packet is, is marked, then they will sort of cut off the, uh, the negotiation of ECN. Um, 
we're we're not doing that actively on the server side because we know it's it's out there on the client. We're not behaving differently from other servers, and it's also like way harder to do that from the server side, as far as I could tell. Um, okay, um, yeah. let's jump to the other the other two questions. Um, uh, Jay Ignacio uh, asks uh, simply: Are the ECN observations all on IPv4? Or do they also include v6? This includes v6 as well. Okay, and then and then the third question was also from Bob and. Uh, he's asking, uh, could increase in congestion experience be due more to congestion over an existing ECN node rather than an ISP having newly deployed ECN? Uh, this is possible. Um, it's a little hard to tell uh, from where I'm standing. Um, you know, there there were uh, more samples on the on the day I chose in July than in March. Uh, part of this can be attributed to the normal growth that we see in traffic over time. Um, but, uh, you know, in both cases, the days I picked here were um, Sundays since COVID started. Um, you know, it's it's not, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a solid yes or no on that, but um, I'm rating it relatively unlikely. Um, but uh, but not with great evidence to do so. Um, so I would I would say if I had contrary evidence, then I would uh, you know I would change my mind on that. Um, okay, okay, thanks, Jake. Um, so uh, just just to reiterate, Jake is uh, saying uh, you know if there's a collaborator that's interested, uh, both he and I have worked on some of this stuff in the past. Maybe it's something we can do in MapRG in the um, hackathon, and. Uh, all right, uh, what I'd like to do now is I'm going to switch to making myself the presenter again, and then uh, we're going to check in with Mark McFadden and see if we can hear him because we can just squeeze no, that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Um, so I'm going to bring up Mark's slides uh, and we'll run through that. Let's see. There we go. I'm going to go view slideshow. Okay, uh, take it away, Mark. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, this will be quick. Uh, this is completely different from the uh, other presentations that we've had today. Uh, this has been motivated by uh, some work that is going on. Oh, um, maybe you could go back one slide here. Yeah, sorry um, about that. That's okay. Uh, anyway, um, uh, there we go. I'm sorry about this. Um, that one right there. So um, thanks. So this has been motivated um, by some work that's going on in the IAB. Uh, and uh, it was a sort of thought experiment originally. Um, a very old RFC, RFC 3552, gives guidance to authors in terms of crafting um, language for security considerations, but that is actually um, um, pretty old if you think about it. And so uh, what we thought uh, was what if you actually examined uh, the RFC since 2003, looked at the security consideration sections and tried to determine whether or not uh, there were fundamental and crucial changes to the threat model for the internet and also um, a significant changes to the way that people were writing uh, the security, uh, security uh, consideration section. And this isn't just a, um, a sort of piece of uh, independent research. The idea was really to inform some of the other work that's going on in the IAB. So uh, next slide, Dave. Yeah, uh, so um, the IAB has already talked about a potential revision to um, uh, 3552. Uh, the IAB currently has a piece of work underway right now called, uh, cleverly enough, Model T that's talking about uh, changes to the threat model that are in it, that's in RFC 3552. Uh, and really, the, the body of work since RFC 3552 is actually fairly substantial um, uh, since we're, uh, we're in the neighborhood now of having um, five and a half thousand more RFCs to look at. Um, so uh, next slide. Thanks. 
Um, so uh, w- uh, there's two things going on here. Uh, f- first of all, I published a draft that actually talked about a possible methodology for doing research on the security considerations text that are in RFCs. And it really proposes a pair of uh, components. Uh, one is a, a quantitative component, um, and more about that later. Uh, the quantitative motive, the component is really a textual analysis of the, the words that are in the RFCs, and then a qualitative analysis. Um, uh, and so what, what the draft does, uh, what the proposed piece of research does is propose this methodology. And what, <clears throat> what you'll see in a moment is uh, that this proposed methodology, one part of it, uh, we've done an experiment on. Um, so the next slide, please, Dave. Um, so what the methodology is in search of is comments for improvement, um, uh, basically, um, except for an experiment that I'll report on in uh, a minute, um, the actual methodology hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, there's no one who's actually executed it, although there have been volunteers who've stepped up to the plate and said they'd be interested in doing it. One of the things I wanted to take some time on uh, here is to report on a quantitative experiment that we've done. And the draft also reports on that quantitative experiment. Uh, so you can find out more details in the draft. And uh, next slide. Uh, perfect. So uh, what my co-author uh, did, and uh, we worked on uh, in the summer and fall of last year, is that we did a word-by-word textual analysis of the security considerations of all the RFCs since 2003. And the thought was here, uh, the, the hypothesis was, uh, would you detect changes in the words that are actually being used to indicate the threats and the threat models? I mean, how is it, if you look over the period of 17 years, has that changed? And would you find patterns that indicate that some terms have become more important to protocol designers by virtue of appearing more often in RFC text? Um, and then One of the things that uh, this last bullet on this slide, my co-author was exceptionally interested in, was taking a look at whether or not security and large-scale security incidents on the public internet had changed the way that the that protocol designers had written the security considerations of their documents. The idea was: Do events in the real world on the public internet affect the way that protocol designers? Do their work and express that work through the security considerations uh, sections of these documents. So this experiment we did perform. And so next slide, Dan. Um, my co-author, my co-author uh, actually uh, executed a uh, experiment that was consistent with the quantitative part of what's in the draft, the quantitative methodology. And basically what this does is it uses a set of uh, Python scripts to extract the security considerations document out of the texts of all of the RFCs and then parse each one of them and get word frequency counts for each. Uh, It's a little more complicated than that. Uh, There, for instance, it supports stop words. Uh, We omit words and you'll see in a second that we conducted a uh, a second experiment to see what the indication of normative words were in security considerations documents. And let me report on that in a second. Uh, So next slide. Um, So the parser that we used uh, was basically uh, an open source parser. Uh, It it removed all non-textual material and it it removed what we call stop words, words that are either words like a and uh, those sorts of things, or um, other words that wouldn't, wouldn't in our judgment, be uh, related to the protocol itself. Uh, it also removed some other materials, for instance, RFC references and anchor URLs and so forth. And then it took all of that text and it parsed it into uh, files by year. So the RFC was actually parsed year by year to, so that we could actually have sort of a time series of what the RFCs looked like, or the uh, security consideration sections of the RFCs. Uh, and then for each one of those years, it built a, uh, a frequency list uh, of all the words that weren't in the designated list of stop words. So uh, next slide. Um, so 
The result of that experiment are a pair of files uh, that go back to 2003. And one is a, uh, a simple um, frequency, a word frequency count file for the number of times a particular word appears in a security consideration section. And one of the things we were looking for, of course, was, well, <clears throat> do new words start to appear uh, as we as we move forward in the years or in response to uh, particular attacks. And a second, uh, a second thing we did uh, was to actually do an RFC count of how many security sections actually referred back to previous RFCs, what those RFCs were, and what the count, what the uh, quantitative data was for that. So Dave, could I go to the next slide? So here are some examples, uh, just so that you can see, this is actually um, taken directly from uh, the internet draft. Um, you can see some word, I won't, I won't read these out, but you can see some words that are uh, fairly uh, recent in 2019 RFCs. And then you can go back and I, what I did for the purposes of this is to just step back five years each time. And you can see that uh, one of the things that we observed was that actually the dis both the distribution of the word counts and the words themselves uh, frankly, didn't change very much over the space of 17 years. Uh, and so that's um, that's interesting to us. I think that's interesting input to the Model T effort, for instance. Uh, it shows that um, that RFC, people who are drafting RFCs are tending to uh, use the same words despite the fact that the internet is evolving significantly. Uh, so um, uh, again, there's more details in the internet draft, but this gives you a feel for what um, the top 10 word counts are in four sample years uh, separated by five years. Uh, so next slide. One of the things we did uh, that we um, sort of discovered was that there were, were many security sections that had normative language in them. Uh, and so I have two slides about this. First of all, if you remove the normative language, you come up with different top 10 lists. But one of the things you'll see here is that once again, the words that are used between 2019 and 2004, frankly, don't change very much. Um, and so what we're seeing is no reflection in the security consideration sections that is apparent by just doing a quantitative analysis of changes in the internet's threat model. And so uh, one more uh, slide. Yeah. Um, so uh, a couple of results here, um, this, this slide may or may not be interesting, but well, we took a look at what the most common words were over the entire period of 17 years. That's in the first bullet there. And then over that, uh, the, uh, the same 17 years, here's a list of, uh, in order of their frequency, what the 75 most frequent words are. Uh, we compared this then to the year to by year one, and this is kind of how we reach our conclusion that not much has changed in security uh, consideration sections. Um, and again, the results are in Appendix B of the internet draft. Um, one more slide, Dan. Um, and so here are some conclusions we draw. Uh, we drew, um, uh, and I've already talked about them, so I won't. I won't. Uh, in the interest of time. Uh, bash this too much, but there really isn't uh, much in the way of major changes if you're just doing uh, word counts of the security consideration sections and actually look at that. That's in the draft proposes that you also do a qualitative analysis, and my co-author and I have not done that yet. Um, it turns out that the word may appears more often than any other normative language in security consideration sections. We found that to be extraordinary. Um, that that um, that the word may instead of must appears in uh, uh, appears much more often in security consideration sections, and so um, uh, that also is input to the IAB and uh, input to uh, other conversations about the internet threat model. And my last slide is just contact details, Dave. Um, I'm happy to first of all have comments. Second of all, um, if uh, anyone wants to talk about uh, helping with the qualitative uh, analysis of the data. Happy to talk about that as well. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thanks, Mark. 
Uh, Nina, did you see any questions in there? If, if not, I, I, I just have one. Uh, I, I love the idea of using the artifact that is the RFCs as a way to determine whether the engineering is moving with the real internet. Was there any any real life uh, internet phenomenon that, that you could correlate with the change in either quantity of uh, words or, or just the quantity of the security considerations itself? I mean, you'd think you'd see evidence of the IEAB or the IETF's policy changes even. Huh? So, um... Uh, we looked at one particular case. Um, this is mostly an anecdotal uh, story, but we looked at the Dyn attack and we thought that um, uh, certain changes to uh, certain maintenance for TCP, um, uh, we would have seen changes to the wording there and we didn't. And we also looked at the latency issue, right? Uh, so for instance, Dave, if we look at, as an example, the Dyn attack, one of the things we said was, well, we wouldn't start to see changes in the RFCs until about a year, 18 months later, because of the publication, um, the the, uh, uh, the pace of publication, right? Um, but when we looked at that particular example, we didn't see much in the way of change. And we actually went back and looked at, tar we targeted particular series of RFCs. For instance, we went to um, a, a IETF area and then limited the examination to just, for instance, the internet area, um, or and and the results were pretty much the same. So, uh, and I see in the chat room that um, uh, Bob suggests that you know privacy should have been appearing more, and uh, I agree with you, Bob, but it it simply doesn't show up when you do the word count, uh, and the word pervasive um, surprisingly appears in very few. RFCs even after uh, the IEB uh, statement on pervasive monitoring. So while we have a very, very strong statement from the IEB about pervasive monitoring, we actually don't see those words showing up in the RFCs afterwards. All right, thank you. Um, we're gonna have to move on because we have just enough time to get the rest of the presentations in. So we're gonna switch to uh, Philip Bruin next. I'm going to make you the presenter, Philip. And let's see, Philip, let's make sure you're unmuted. Yeah, hi. Okay, you're ready to go. Yeah, so I'm Philip and I'm working for Ericsson. Um, I want to tell you something about the behavior of TCP cubic that we have discovered in the context of my master thesis when doing measurements with cubic connections on mobile radio networks. So here you can see our measurement setup in the middle. We have deployed an HTTP server that is directly connected to the core of a mobile radio network and an HTTP client that connects to the radio access network through an LTE modem. The host here runs TCP cubic in default settings. And the roundup time between server and client is between 18.5 and 30 milliseconds. Um, and last of all, the radio link here can be seen as ideal in terms of a stable signal quality and no interference or cross traffic. So then taking this measurement setup and doing file downloads, we measured the total transfer time that also includes the time for the connection setup, et cetera, and uh, calculated the file throughput as file size divided by transfer time. Um, when we then plotted the empirical CDF for two different file sizes, we were actually surprised to see that the file, the file throughput shows such a significant variance. So for example, for a five megabyte file, we have samples between 30 megabit per second and 50 megabit per second. So part of this is due to the current Linux implementation uh, and the fact that a smaller file seems to show a larger variance compared to a bigger file, then led us to the conclusion that this might have something to do with the slow start. So then TCB cubic uses a hybrid slow start scheme called high start. So the window growth function is actually the same as in TCP Reno, but high start has two mechanisms to find a suitable exit point. So an exit point before we lose any packets. One of these mechanisms look at the, looks at the act train length. So the length and time of back to back acts that return to the sender. In our measurement, this actually never triggers, so we don't discuss this here. 
So then the second mechanism looks, tries to detect the delay increase. So if the current roundup time exceeds the minimum roundup time by a value of theta, this then indicates congestion at the bottleneck link. So here the minimum roundup time is defined as the overall minimum roundup time that, that we have seen throughout the connection. And the current roundup time is defined on a per round basis. So the current roundup time is always the smallest roundup time sample from the first 8x of a round. I have summarized the delay increase condition down here, and the value of theta is actually defined as the minimum roundup time divided by 8, but is clamped between the values of 4 and 16. So since in our measurements the, the roundup time is small, theta actually always takes the value of 4. So then going back to this condition here, we can, we can actually identify two reasons why this condition can become true. So either we already have found our minimum roundup time, and then the current roundup time increases, making this condition true, or we are outside of the sampling phase of a round, so beyond the first 8x of a round. So then the current roundup time is fixed, but the minimum round, so we, but we could find a new minimum roundup time when the roundup time drops. So these are two separate reasons why this condition can become true. Since this is a little detailed, I want to give you an example and walk you through uh, one example. So I want to walk you through one example for each of them. So here I have plotted the round trip time samples that correspond to different packets. And so for the first round, and here I have to say that the definition of a round from the high start point of view actually contains a bug. So high start considers the first 11 packets to belong to the first round instead of the first 10 packets. But actually what's the case is since the initial window size is 10, the um, sender sends 10 packets in the first round, not 11. But let's stick with this for, for this example. So first of all, we have to find the minimum round to time plus theta, so the threshold value that we compare the current round to time against. And then we find our current round to time as the minimum round to time during the sampling phase, which is here shown in gray. So as long as we are below the, as long as the dashed line is then above the solid line, we continue and go for another round. Each time we go for another round, we then reset the current round of time. And then again, we find our threshold, um, which then here drops on the 31st packet. And we find our current round of time, which is this time 20. So again, the dashed line is above the solid line. So we go for the four, so we again reset the current round of time then and go for the third round. So this time we've already found our minimum round trip time. So the threshold here stays constant. But what happens now is that the current round trip time increases from a value of 20 to 22, which then makes this condition to become true. So then we keep on sampling, but do not find any other smaller sample. And we exit the slow start at the first egg after the sampling phase. So this then results in a congestion window at the exit point of 51. This, uh, in the, the example for the second reason is actually pretty similar. So in the first round, nothing else happens. In the second round, we again see the drop on the 31st packet. But this time, the round trip time of the 15th packet is higher than um, before. So now the current round trip time is 22 instead of 20 which then makes the drop on the 31st packet um, to force this condition to become true. And therefore we leave the slow start immediately instead of going for the next round and leaving up here. So this time the congestion window at the exit point is only 40. So now we have understood these two reasons and we want to, we wanted to know, okay, how likely are, are there, how likely are these two reasons? So therefore we did another experiment and actually figured out that the probability that we leave the high start due to an increasing round trip time, which is actually how the delay increase mechanism is supposed to work, only happens in 30% of the cases. But in 70% of the cases, we leave the high start when the round trip time decreased. So we actually left the high start when we set a new minimum round trip time. So now you, you might ask, 
how can this even happen that the router time drops in the middle of the connection? Um, to understand this, I have to tell you something about the uplink scheduling in radio access and radio access networks. So in, in a mobile radio network, the radio access network actually controls all the transmissions, so also the uplink transmissions. So the modem needs uplink resources in order to transmit its data, or in this case, the X. So then there are two cases. So either the modem already has some, uh, some uplink resources, then it can just piggyback a buffer status report onto the next data transmission, telling the radio access network that it needs more resources uh, to transmit the rest of its buffers. So the rest of the data that it's still in the buffer. If the modem does not have any valid, valid uplink grant, it has to rely on a one bit scheduling request that is sent in the uplink control channel. So to understand this, look at this example here on the right. So in the first round, the server will send 10 packets to the client and the client will gen then generate 10 X and send them to the modem. S consider the modem to be idle from uh, a transmission point of view. So then the modem has to queue these 10 X and wait for the next opportunity to send a scheduling request. After some time, the modem, uh, the radio access network will then respond with a small amount of, um, with a scheduling grant that grants a small amount of resources. Since I cannot know how much data the modem has in its buffer because the scheduling request is only a one bit information. The modem can then fit, for example, two X and piggyback a buffer status report telling the radio access network it still has eight X in its buffer. So the first uh, two X are then forwarded to the server and the radio access network will then grant uh, a, a send a, suf a sufficiently large grant in order to, so the modem can then in the next step send the rest of its buffer. So even though the 10 packets arrived at the client at the same time and the client generated the X at the same time, the X will arrive at, uh, will re so the X will re return to the server at different points in time and therefore the packets can have different roundtrip times. Another reason for different round, for the roundtrip time variance is also that the MAC layer has some peri periodicities. So when you look at the, uh, this graph here, this time I've plotted the mean roundtrip time of individual packets. And by looking at the first 10 packets here, you can precise, precisely see what I just explained. So the first two packets have a smaller roundtrip time and then the roundtrip time ramps up by about eight milliseconds on on the third packet. So then this kind of scheduling principles also lead to the fact that the first two X of the third round are then transmitted together with the last X of the second round. So this means that these two X here do not have to wait for any scheduling grant, which could be triggered by either a scheduling request or a, or a buffer status report. So they, they can just hop onto the transmission of these X. This then causes the round time to drop so significantly. And as we have seen in the previous examples, this then in many cases leads to a false positive detection of network congestion and then too early exit point. So the, at this point, the connection is still far from the maximum throughput. So then in the end, these MAC layer effects dominate the behavior and the performance of TCP cubic. So to conclude, so we have seen that uh, qubit connections can see a significant variance in the file throughput, which is due to the high start that usually, or in many cases, uh, fails to find a suitable exit point due to the latency variance of LTE. So, um, as I said earlier, there, were, um, can be, there can be made a couple of improvements. So on the one hand, the bug that the high start reset was done one packet too late, so that the first round would contained the first 11 packets instead of the first 10 packets. Um, we actually fixed, fixed this in our version of the kernel. And then there was also, a, our research also led to a different kernel patch that now allows every roundtrip time sample to reduce the current roundtrip time. So this means that we do not exit in the current round when we have a new, when we find a new minimum, minimum roundtrip time. So, Taking both of these together, we actually read our measurements and found that for a five megabyte file, the throughput, uh, the throughput increased by about 15.7%.
And what you can also see by the graph here is that the portion of samples that is close to the mean increased from about 55% to about 85%. So the jitter, the overall jitter was reduced, um, even though we st uh, still have our strong outliers. So this is because there's still some effects that are not compensated by either the bug fix or the kernel patch. So since high start still does not consider the round trip time variance, it may still not be well suited for mobile radio networks. And in the end, it's uh, important to say that even though we conducted our trials with LTE, uh, we presume that the same effects will also happen on 5G, since there we use the same kind of uplink scheduling principles. This is actually it. All right, thanks and for I, that. I'm willing to answer questions now, or you can also send us a, an email later. So either me or my colleague, Mach, uh, my colleague Machek, who worked with me on this. All right, Philip, thank you so much. Uh, there's been a, a, a little bit of a lively discussion about, about High Start in the chat session. Uh, and I'll, I'll suggest that those folks do what you just suggested, take it offline with you. Um, by email, or you can use the MapRG mailing list as well. Um, for instance, uh, Bob comment, Bob Briscoe commented that um, High Start is on by default in Linux Cubic, um, but according to a mini survey, he says he did of four to five CDNs about uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, for instance, Google, Microsoft, and Apple, um, all but one had disabled High Start. Uh, do, you, do you have a comment, Phil, before we wrap up? Uh, no, no, I don't. I just, okay. as we see, as we saw it, it really can behave badly when used on mobile radio networks. So. Okay. Um, thanks. So, um, in the interest of time, because we just have 25 minutes for 25 minutes of presentations left, um, we're going to switch to Mike Kosek being the presenter. And let me do that by finding Mike in the participants lists here. And we have a little bit of uh as mike gets set up uh i'm going to paste in the chat right now a link to an etherpad that uh miria my co my coach here who's on top of things better than i am reminded me we're supposed to be maintaining what are the blue sheets where basically you just sign your name and, and your organization and so say you were at the meeting so it'd be a big help to us if you would visit that url i just posted there the etherpad map rg url and just add your name and affiliation there uh, so we get a, a list that approximates the what about we saw about 74 participants on today and we've got 56 right now. So in the next half hour, if you could sign that, that would be great, just like you would if we were at a real IETF meeting. Mike, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. You're ready to go. All right, thank you, Dave. So this is a quick recap on our work of TCP conformance, which has been presented at PAM in March of this year. So uh, TCP has been analyzed in the past decades. However, every study focused on different aspects of uh, TCP and TCP extensions. And our question was, okay, how is the conformance to the minimum requirements? So the basic requirements, which are phrased by the must keywords in the RFCs. And for this, we chose an active scanning approach. We have uh, did uh, controlled testbed environment measurements. First of all, we followed up with a large scale measurement campaign and for this, we use the tracebox approach to also detect metal box interference with these minimum requirements here. So for our test cases, we looked at the RC793 BIS, the draft 14 version, and uh, we looked at different aspects. So we checked uh, if the checksums are correctly validated, if uh, it, uh, options uh, which are unknown are correctly ignored, if the MSS, which are stated, are uh, the RC stated defaults, if the effective send MSS is honored, if reserved flags are ignored and zeros, and if the urgent pointer could be processed segments of arbitrary lengths. So uh, with these test cases, we started out, and uh, this is something we uh, could, of course, only be observed on the wire. So uh, there are a lot of more more requirements in the RC draft, and we started with this because they, yeah, uh, low hanging fruit, I would say. First of all, we do some control testbed measurements. Uh, what we see here is that uh, only Linux and Lightweight IP showed full conformance to our test cases. When we look at Windows 10, then we see that the MSS defaults stated in the RC are used as a lower bound. So you cannot uh, actually 
uh, in this freeware handshake use something lower than it's stated in the RFC. For macOS, the 1024 bytes are used as a default regardless of the IP version. So this falls short of the IPv6 and uh, exceeds the IPv4 defaults. On uh, micro IP, we actually observed some crashes and uh, this was done on urgent pointer data, which was pointing beyond the segment size. And we issued a pull request for this. Uh, this was especially interesting as ContiQS and ContiQNG OS uh, are also vulnerable from this issue. And this pull request got merged and is fixed now. For CSTAR, we saw that the host OS is supported of offloaded checksum features is not verified. We uh, we reported this issue, however, to this date, we did not get any response from this. All right, for our large scale measurement campaign, we looked at different target hosts uh, from the HTTP archive. We sampled CDN targets. There are 28K unique targets hosts. We uh, took uh, around 476,000 uh, unique target hosts from the Alexa top 1 million list. And uh, on sensors, which provides internet wide port scans, we took around 3.2 million target hosts. So let me start with the notation here in our three columns. We see the three data sets, and in each sub column, we see the different results which are presented. Um, as a percentage. So for UNK subcolumn here, this is unknown. These are not clearly determinable results. This can have multiple issues. For example, if a pretest was successful, uh, but the actual test uh, of the feature we wanted to check, uh, we did not get a response to our SYN packet. Then we have F target, which shows non conformities raised by the targets, and failure pass shows non conformities raised by middle boxes. Okay, you're digging right in. First of all, we have the checksum test. Uh, we did this in two ways. Uh, first of all, which uh, we chose a random incorrect checksum, and we also did a test with uh, zero checksum. And for checksum, we saw that the CDN shows the lowest failure rates overall, and actually no on-path modifications, which is quite good news. However, Alexa and Census each show around 3% target failure. So in around 3% of the targets, they did not validate the checksum and responded to our false, uh, false uh, checksum package. Next of all, we have option unknown. And so no single S really stands out here, but we observed that the highest failure rates are within ISP networks. And this is exactly the same behavior as we saw in the MSS missing test. So for MSS missing, we saw um, around 0.4% failure on the pass of the census data set. And these are also primarily located in ISP networks. And digging down on this, we saw that the MSS is inserted here, and this is most likely due to the PPPoE encapsulation done by access routers. Next up, we have reserve flags, and we see up to 1.8% target failure on census here. So, um, they actually did not respond to our probing packets at all. And this is really bad news for extensibility as yeah, using these flags really doesn't uh, provide any connection to these targets at all. Uh, however, when looking at the RC, we see that ignoring and zeroing the reserve flags is actually no formal must requirement. So uh, for this, we propose to add this at a formal must requirement within the RC uh, 793 BIS version. Lastly, we have the urgent pointer, and the urgent pointer shows the overall highest failure rates with up to 7.3% uh, failure on the census data set. And these census fates are primarily located in ISP networks again, and around 99% of these failures are just silently discarded, so the data, so no connection is possible using the urgent pointer with these holes. Um, the RC states for the urgent pointer that the usage is actually discouraged, but the implementation is still mandatory. And it might be an idea, he, idea here to remove this mandatory implementation re requirement to reflect its deprecation in the RFCs. All right, so that's for our quick recap. Uh, please have a look at our paper if you're interested. There are a lot of more test cases and more details in there. We also released our data set 
uh, and we released our code. So uh, our tool called TCP Rec is on GitHub. Feel free to contribute, feel free to share your results. I'm happy to progress this further. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, and we have a couple of minutes for questions. The first one that was in the chat was uh, Jay Ignacio asked, how did you determine, this was during your results presentation, for instance, the results slide two, how did you determine the middle box errors instead of, uh, determine the middle box errors instead targets? Uh, yes. Let me just bring up my backup slide here uh, in our methodology. So uh, we used the tracebox approach um, where we encoded the TTL in multiple fields and uh, just sent out um, multiple uh, increasing TTL probes and uh, listened for the ICMP time exceeded messages. And we did this test case specific. So for example, if uh, we wanted to test uh, if on a pass the, uh, the TCP checksum is uh, corrected, then we would get a reply with a corrected checks, checksum with this approach. And uh, then we could say, okay, this was a failure that actually happened on the path and not on the target. And we did this for all of our test cases. So this was a lot of handcrafting. There's no general approach here uh, besides the trace box approach, which generally can give you a hint if there is a middle box or not. All right, um, yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, I don't see any other questions there, and we're just on time. So, uh, and J. Ignacio says thanks. So, I'm going to uh, switch the uh, presentation, to switch to the presenter being Stephen Strohs uh, for the last presentation of the session. So Stephen, you should be the presenter now. All right. There we go. Good. One last one last reminder, uh, uh, please visit that URL that I posted in the chat uh, to sign up for the uh, blue sheets. We've got about, I think, 60% of the folks have signed up so far. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. All right. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, this is a this is a summary talk of uh, work that we've presented already at TMA and at NRW, and this covers the deep organization of 2A10 slash 12 for a little bit of context, this was the first slash 12 allocated by the IANA to any of the registries in, at the time, I think 13 or nearly 13 years, uh, which is long enough for, you know, router configurations to become stale and things for, you know, to be baked into the routing system. So before we issued it to members, we wanted to light that up, get that announced out there and, um, generally try and do some uh, checking to make sure that it wasn't packed with pollution, which is unlikely, but you don't know until you measure. So the timeline for this was, we actually got the slash 12 back in late 2019, but in early 2020, the uh, previous slash 12 was nearly done. We were imminently about to start allocating from 2.8.10 slash 12. So we had about one week to advertise this and collect what we could. We announced nine prefixes in total, the full slash 12, then four slash 32s and four slash 48s. Each of these were configured slightly differently in terms of whether they had a routing write object in the writing database or whether they had an RPKI row. And the 32s and the 48s all had a responsive target. So each of them each of the eight addresses in total would respond to ICMP echo requests. This has mostly already been covered in the TMA paper and the ANRW paper presented last week. So links to the papers and the videos uh, for the papers, both there, um, if you wanna go follow up on particular details. For the rest of this, I'm gonna cover basically the summary version of what we found. Um, the, the bulk of the TMA paper is basically traffic analysis. And the way that we kind of think about this is with the IPv4 space, you could listen to, for example, a slash eight, if you have a full slash eight lying around. And depending on some of the behavior, you may be able to draw general conclusions about background noise to the IPv4 space. Like each v4 slash eight is gonna be different in terms of what it attracts. But the V4 space is also small enough that you're going to see internet wide quote unquote scans. The V6 space is quite different. It's a bit more like taking a telescope and pointing at the sky and 
simply observing what you see in that part of the sky, there may be something generalizable there, but it's more likely that you can report on what you saw in that corner. So that slash 12 is a lot of address space, but it's still a very small part of the V6 address space in total. So what we got is what we got. And I would be careful with drawing general conclusions around that. Um, the, the part that's kind of a good start is the uh, bulk of the traffic that we actually captured was our own traffic. Uh, we sent a lot of measurements into this space to the responsive targets from the Ripe Atlas platform. And so the vast majority uh, in my head, I'm thinking that looks like around about 90 to 95% of the traffic that we captured was generated by Ripe Atlas. So we can ignore that for most of the rest. The remaining traffic consists around six and a half million captured packets, which if it was on an average, which it's not, that would be around about 10 packets per second, which is, you know, at that point, nobody cares anymore. The traffic can be carved out in a couple of broad categories. The bulk of the TCP traffic was what looked like an orchestrated trace route campaign to locate responsive, uh, well, to do, I guess, to do two things, to map out topology and then find anything that's responding in port 80. Um, the DNS, sorry, the UDP traffic was around about 50% DNS and the bulk of the ICMP traffic was solicited echo requests to the addresses that we set up. So for each of those in turn, around about five and a half million of the packets contained a TCP payload and they were doing some kind of TCP trace route, right? So, um, trying to repeatedly reach the same target but with an, an ever-increasing TTL until it eventually gives up. All of that traffic has the same basic characteristics, so like the same source port, no payload, send flag is set, nothing else is active in the packet. The MSS value is set as if it's configured for an IPv4 world. There's a couple of glitches like that. And most of this traffic in the um, activity graphs that are in the TMA paper arrived in a couple of short periods very near the start of the study. So like very soon after the full slash 12 was advertised, this this TCP scanner lit up. Um, my gut feeling is that whatever this thing is, I don't know who's running it really, whatever that thing is, it was never expecting to see address space that large and uh, something bugged out in whatever the platform was and it started sending far too many packets into the space. And my gut feeling for that, the reason I have that gut feeling is that once we lit up the 32s and 48s, there were specific trace routes into those addresses, but at a much lower volume. Um, so those lit up very quickly and then stopped very quickly, uh, which was good. Basically, they bounce around in addre random addresses, though. Um, we There was a distinct port scanning operation from one origin to around about... Uh, uh, sorry, I have target addresses in the next slide. Around 164,000 packets uh, doing port scanning from one origin. And then, like, tens of thousands uh, with a destination port 443 and an act flag set. I can't remember if they have payloads, but I figure something is either backscatter or is bouncing around looking for resets rather than synax. Um, and there's a lot of general noise that's otherwise uninteresting beyond that point. For the trace route campaign, the addresses that that campaign selected appear to be uh, random bits filling the bottom 120, uh, sorry, 116 bits of each address. And the assertion there comes from like the campaign selects in total 261,000 targets spread across 261,000 slash 64. It's like it's not trying to do anything smart with uh, particular addresses inside the slash 64. It's just trying to get something, whether it's topology mapping or not. The remaining targets are pretty well distributed. This graph on the right is ranked like most popular slash 64 target. Um, I'm going down from there. But there's 133,000 targets, and this forms a very, very long tail where many of the addresses are targeted maybe once or twice. The top target in that list was uh, targeted the most for the port scanning campaign from, from one origin. Um, the, and 
the set of sources is again reasonably broad. Like there aren't, uh, like there's not much evidence of sources doing things like address cycling within its own slash sixty four. Uh, like uh, sources pop up and then vanish. The port numbers that were targeted are a little bit uh, interesting. Maybe like I've I've taken port eighty out of this plot because it would swamp everything with the trace route campaign and what's left. It's kind of broad. Like at some point, basically everything is is attempted by something. There's a lot of noise. The most popular target is port four four three, and then from there it hits. Uh, and I'm going to go by memory here. Six three seven nine, which I think is Redis. Five two 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 is maybe XMPP, and I lose the track from there. There's quite a lot of traffic with a TCP port zero set. Um, but this is aside from a general leaning towards the low numbers that the port scanning does. A lot of this is like random randomized payloads and weird targets. The UDB traffic was much less interesting, I guess. There wasn't much of it. 50% of the DNA, uh, the UDP that we captured contained a DNS payload that looked like legitimate DNS. Like there were DNS queries for like for A and quad A records for popular names like Google.com or various CDNC names or whatever else. This this one we did actually approach the uh, network operator and they found the person who was running a DNS resolver, which was misconfigured and was sending uh, these queries into our address space. So that one was in theory fixed, but we're no longer announcing that address space, so we can't verify that it was actually fixed. The ICMP traffic was largely solicited. The this is again a on the right a ranking of the most popular targets and the top eight targets are the the eight uh basically reflect the eight responsive targets that we created and we requested the network operators send their traffic to this graph is ignoring the right atlas traffic also so most of the icmp goes to where we asked people to send icmp echo requests the next most popular is 2A10 with all the zeros, which was unresponsive, but a lot of people selected that one rather than uh, colon colon one. Maybe people truly are that lazy, I'm not sure. And there's a long tail of otherwise uh, essentially randomized traffic uh, targets again. A bunch of these uh, in the remaining targets are like genuinely what appears to be randomized payloads with uh, invalid ICMP types and codes and so forth. So a lot of that stuff is just weird. And it's the numbers at that point get so vanishingly small that we basically draw under draw a line under it and declare it to be acceptable noise. Like there's nothing that we observe in this data that, that spooked us. There's nothing that we observe in this data that would make us say, okay, this particular slice of the address space we want to withhold from the membership. And that was part of the purpose of the study. We cover aspects of the routing state in both the TMA and the NRW papers, uh, although not in a spectacular amount of detail. Um, we wanted to make sure that first the space was basically routable. And then from there, we used the Ripe Atlas measurement platform to ensure that it was actively reachable if we tried to get there. And in general, it was. We got about 99% hit rates on our pings and trace routes, which is basically uh, typical, apart from a couple cases, uh, including um, AS8881, which I think is Versatile in Germany. Couldn't We got no responses to any of the targets on that one, and I think we inspected the PCAP data, and that one is... Uh, inbound filtering. So we saw the echo requests at the targets, but the probes themselves never received the responses. And uh, the other more interesting one maybe is AS3320, which is Deutsche Telekom, and then ASNs that appear to be routing via AS3320 could reach a subset of the targets. And for those ones, they were the probes were unable to reach the responsive addresses inside the prefixes that were configured to be the least routable. So the prefixes that had neither the route objects nor the RPKI row, which is kind of fine. Like those are the ones that we would expect to be less reachable. So that's completely okay. And on those ones, we didn't see the echo requests arriving at the 
um, at the route collector that was announcing the space. So for those ones, they are filtering the routes at, I guess, 3320. So our current status and where we are with this, this was a study in January. This is basically historic at this point. The RIPE Atlas data and the REST routing data is, of course, all public. Uh, the routing data in particular, you can also, it would be interesting to look at from other vantage points, such as route views or PCH data or whatever else. And now that some time has passed, we might be able to get to the point of actually releasing the captured data is something that we want to do. But it's uh it's the it's trying to do that balance between how much of this is weird uh data that nobody cares about and how much of it is like identifiable data that tells us something so we need to look at how we um mask that data or whether we strip payloads or or what we do with it to be cool but six months have passed so um time is on our side the address makes so, sense. So St Stephen, we just have about a minute left in the official time. I'm happy to go over, yep. but I just wanted to let you know in case people have to leave. Yep, sure. Um, so I'm about done. So the, the 2A10-12 is now in use soon after we ended the study. Um, so the week in January is on the left-hand side. Soon after we ended, that was issued to members, and then those prefixes started lighting up. The only reason that the numbers go up and to the right is that risk continues to add new peers. So um, we have more peers simply listening to and receiving these announcements. And the address space that we allocated our 8s, 32s and 48s from was put into quarantine did, because we did active measurements to it and we solicited traffic to it. That space is now out of quarantine. The standard is six months. So the space has now been reissued and it I haven't checked today, but it's likely to show up in the wild soon if it's been allocated to somebody. So there's a potential comparison there between um, the address space announced from our route collector system and the address space announced from somebody else, if somebody wants an interesting writing uh, side study. And these are only my end notes indicating uh, what we did here. There isn't anything in this space that's entirely problematic. The routing and reachability seem to be good. And so we were completely happy going ahead and issuing that address space to our members. And that is uh, my high level summary of these two papers. So that's, that's what I have. So I'm super happy to take questions. All right, thanks so much, Stephen. I don't see anyone in the queue in the chat session. So I think we'll wrap it up. Thanks so much to you and all of the presenters for participating in our measurement community and bringing this interim meeting together. Uh, let us know. I want to thank Brian and Nina for uh, doing this experiment with us, this joint meeting. Let either them or us, uh, Miria and I, know if you if you like the joint meeting uh, and uh, and how you want, how would you like us to meet in the future. Um, and I want to especially thank Miria for encouraging uh, presentations and helping curate the content because uh, she did a lion's share of it uh, this time. Again, um, have, have a good day, folks. All right. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.